morning. Happy Easter. Good morning, good morning. Element Church, good to see you here. Hey, real quick, if you're new here, uh, welcome. One of the things we say at the beginning of every gathering, and we'll continue to say it, is that our hope for you is that you would encounter the risen King, and that you would take a next step in your faith. Some of you are here, and you're like, man, my next step today is just surrendering my life to God, and we want to help you with that. Some of you need a Bible. We have Bibles. Uh, we had a big shipment of Bibles get delayed. It's delayed. It's but delayed. Uh, but yeah, Jesus is still alive, so it's okay. It's okay. Um, so there's a QR code on the back of every one of these seats. If you just take your camera out, just hover over it. Don't take a picture of it. <laughs> hover over it, and there is a link. Uh, we'd love to help you with your next steps. If you need prayer or whatever, we're here to help you grow in your relationship with Jesus. So, Morgan, awesome. what do we have on the docket? Yeah, just a few announcements. Uh, students, you have youth group uh, this Wednesday from 7 to 9. That's for grades six, 6 through 12 right here at Elman Church. And then community groups, there are still plenty of openings in some of our community groups. So, um, again, if you want to go to that QR code or go to our social media or on our app, um, there's a space where you can sign up, and it's a good time to jump in. So there's always a good time to jump in. Morning prayer tomorrow, uh, 6 to 6. Yep. So uh, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. If you're new to that, we just come and open up the building um, and let the worship music sort of go for 12 hours, and you come and go as you want. Come and pray. Come and sit. Come and read. Uh, just whatever you want to do to sort of connect with God. It's a good way to, like, start your Monday off. So it's from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Awesome. And then tomorrow night is um, a Romanian evening. Yes. So Kalen is our Romanian missionary. So stand to your feet, Kalen Cantors. And Kalen has been rooming and serving with Rooksy, and Rooksy is a Romanian. Rooksy, stand to your feet, young lady. And so, so these gals um, are, they're, they're going to be hosting a Romanian Q&A with some, with some Romanian food, right? And some cool things they got to share. So just, if you have any questions, you can uh, hit them up as quick as you can today, but all the information will be on our app and uh, on the In The Loop. So Thank you, ladies, so much. We're excited for that. That's tomorrow at what time? 6.30. Tomorrow at 6.30, and I think it's going to be in the student room. It's going to be here, so 6.30. It's going to be here. Yeah. So, cool. Awesome. Last thing is, um, if you didn't notice, we have a full house, which means we have a very full house in our eKids right now. So, and we had about 14 people volunteer to be back there with eKids and give up their Sunday morning. Come on now. Come on. <laughs> Man, some of you parents are like, oh, man, I just need to go give them $100. And they probably wouldn't be opposed to that at all. So, um, no, we're super thankful. Uh, if you don't know, Element Church is, I mean, we have probably, I think we have 84 or 94 something, 84, 94 volunteers that serve in this church, which is just unbelievable. Um, so uh, we're just super grateful, super grateful. Um, our, our, my hope today is this. My hope today is that you would decide, not through an emotional experience, not through something clever, but you would decide, make an intelligent decision to be a, an apprentice of Jesus. In other words, to enter in, not to an emotional, conjured up you know, thing, but like a true relationship. Like you would dare to ask the question, what would happen to my life if I really followed Jesus and try to live by the scriptures. Like, that's my hope. That's my hope. And so today, uh, we kind of conclude a little mini-series that we were in, and we entitled it, Jesus is King. Everybody say, Jesus is King. Jesus is King. Awesome. I'm trusting that everyone in the lobby is saying, Jesus is King. <laughs> Tracy Kasumba, I need you to take an attendance if everybody, no, I'm just kidding. Jesus is King. We started off by Jesus encountering a guy who had tons of demons in the Gospel of Mark. If you're new to the church here, we're going through one of the letters of the accounts of Jesus' life called the Gospel of Mark. We're going through that this year. And Jesus gets off a boat and he encounters this guy who's just whacked out. He's got tons of demons. He's just super, super, super oppressed. And, and the guy's out of his mind. He's half naked. He's been living in the tombs. Jesus steps out of the boat and he just gets bum rushed by this guy. And we talked about that we got to encounter the power of Jesus as king. Because when you see life through a spiritual lens, you understand that you are in spiritual warfare every day. And whether you believe that or not, it's still true. There is darkness and there is light. And so Jesus 
heals this man, and we get to see the power of Jesus. And then Palm Sunday, we engaged in the worship of Jesus as king, which was so cool, because Jesus, for the first time, is like allowing himself to be worshipped. And like, and you know, we're, we're reading the Gospels, and we know it's coming, right? We know it's coming. And he allows himself to be worshipped as king, and people just go nuts. We talked about the worship of Jesus as king. And then Friday, we had our Good Friday gathering, and we talked about beholding Jesus as our sacrifice. And the reality is is that we are far from God without Jesus. And it was his body and his blood that paved the way back to our creator. And then today, we embrace and proclaim the lordship of Jesus as king. That he is risen. That he is risen. That he is alive. So when we pick up in the story, track with me. Right now, the Pharisees and the rulers, it's been the third day and they're a little nervous. Have you ever had one of those days you just wanted to be over? Like as soon as you got on the job site, you had this thought, I can't wait for this day to be done, right? As soon as you got home, right? You're like, I can't wait for this day to be done. I don't get nervous. I just get hot. So just some of you are like, what is he about to do? I just, I just get hot. So they're nervous. They're nervous because they remember this Jesus, this rebel, had been saying this thing for weeks, talking about this. And it's recorded in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 17. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And Jesus told him, and he will rise on the third day. It's making them a little nervous. Imagine they woke up, and their first thought was like, I can't wait for this day. To be over with hesitancy i imagine they looked at one another and said let's just get through this day let's just let's let's get through it and let's make sure that he stays dead because once the third day is done ah, we can breathe take our seat as our rightful religious leaders and say told you so he was a fraud they're nervous but i need to remind us today that god is not a liar and he will not be mocked. If Jesus said he's going to rise on the third day, he rose on the third day. And we pick up in the scriptures of Matthew's account in chapter 28. It says, After the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, naturally. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone. And I love this. I don't know why I love this. And he sat on it. Ain't that something? I just love that. It's like a kid just sitting on the curb. He's like, he just sat on it. To me, that just shows, right, the power of God. The power of God. And he sat on it, and his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. True? That would have been me. But an angel said to the women, Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is what? He's risen. He's risen. He says, come and see the place where he lay. Then so they went in quickly, or, or the, 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 the angel said, then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him. See, I have told you. So they, they departed quickly. They just took off from the tomb with great fear and great joy. You ever been in that place where you're like you're scared and excited all at the same time? Can you imagine the feeling that they had? Like they just encountered an angelic being, right, who just told them the best news ever. They're like, ah, yeah, okay, okay let's, let's go. And they take off. So departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. They ran to tell the disciples, and behold, it's almost like Jesus couldn't wait to get there. Jesus meets them and says, greetings. Can you imagine? You're like, you're just, you know, and all of a sudden Jesus is like, What's up? Greetings, and they came up and took hold of his feet and they worshiped him. And Jesus said, Listen, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. And they took off. Well, while they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. 
Can you just imagine this motion? Oh. Some of you parents have done that. You're thinking everything's fine. You're sitting there going about your day. Somebody comes in and tells you something, and you just went, oh. The guards come in. They tell the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled the elders and taken counsel, yeah, you better do something. They gave a significant sum of money to the soldiers and said, hey, tell everybody this little story. That the disciples came by night and stole him away while you were sleeping. And if it comes to the governor's ears, listen, we'll satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money, obviously, and did as they were directed. And this is the story that spread among the Jews to this day. I love this little part about the guards. <laughs> because it would be punishable by death for them to let a prisoner free. Which makes me wonder, how much money did they pay them? True. It couldn't have been like, here's a 20, just keep it between us. It's like, no, bro, we just lost our jobs, and we're about to lose our life. Like, uh-uh, ante up. They're nervous. It's as if the chief priests, though, and the rulers had this what-if plan, though. It's interesting. They don't seem very surprised. Nothing is recorded like they're going, oh, no, oh, no, what do we do, what do we do? Nothing. They're just like, okay, Jerry, you were right. Let's take out the plan B. What was the plan B? Jerry goes over to the safe. He's like, it's, it's the money thing. It's time to bribe these guys. They don't seem overly concerned. They don't seem concerned even about going to the tomb and validating it, which I think is odd, don't you? It's almost like they're like, ah, oh, he did it. He did it. It would have been so easy just to go with the guards and go, okay, can you just, can you, we're just going to take a walk. Nope, they hold a meeting, they come up with a story, they get a pile of cash, give it to the guards and say, shut up and say this. And they take off. Interesting, we never hear about these guards again. I imagine they open up Swiss bank accounts and took off and they're living in the Bahamas, <laughs> right? They had to get out of there. Now listen, if you're like me, you understand that the resurrection, there's a little bit of tension in this, isn't there? There's obviously big pushback with people rising from the dead, True. Let's just be honest about this. Tons of pushback. And I wish somebody had told me the things that I'm going to tell you to ponder in this little brief section years ago. Because I would hear this story, not as a Christian, but just hearing it, and I just always kind of rolled my eyes. I was like, I mean, I was in until he rose from the dead, right? Like, I was in until the whole Easter thing, and now I'm like, seriously? I've never seen that trick before, ever. It was hard for me to grasp. And I wish somebody had taken me aside and just said, wait, think about this. So here, I'm going to do that for you, because nobody did it for me. So, think about this. I don't know all of your names. Think about this. If the followers of Jesus, the disciples, wanted to cover up a lie, let's just say hypothetically, they went to the tomb, they took Jesus' dead body, found out to do something with his dead body besides bury it, took it and hid it, and they got together and said, we got to tell the story because this is so embarrassing. we got to tell the story that he resurrected. And they got together, and they said, okay, let's fabricate a lie. Can I just tell you, the very last thing they would do in telling the story, don't take offense to this, ladies, but they would have not told the story from a first-person woman's perspective. And this is why. In that century, women were not valued as valuable testimonies. Do the history lesson. They weren't valued as equals. It would have been erroneous for them to start the lie and go well this is how we found out there were some ladies and people would have been like <laughs> okay hold on that was just the culture they would have never done that also it would have been really easy to prove that jesus was dead because the tomb wasn't in, in a hidden place Everybody knew Joseph of Arimathea because Joseph of Arimathea, if you do some background, he was part of the Grand Council. This guy was rich. They knew him. This is the whole reason he could have gone and got the body from uh, Pilate because he had clout. It was his tomb. And listen, you can't hollow out a big rock without people knowing what you're doing, right? Like I come to your house and I hear a, I hear a chainsaw and some things going on in the back and, and, and I go, what are you doing? You're like, don't worry about it. Like I'm asking questions. Where's your wife? Where's your kids? Where's your dog, right? I'm asking questions. They could have easily just gone and looked at the tomb. By the way, why didn't the Pharisees just go check the tomb for themselves? That kind of bugs me. Why didn't they just go do that? They're so quick to make up a story and pay off the guard and just get it done, right? I find that odd. 
Here's another one. Why do people continually, from that time until now, give their life for the gospel? How far would you go to preserve a lie? How far? You're like, I'm not answering that question. (laughs) How far would you go to preserve a lie? Would you give your life for a lie? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that. Historians and archaeologists and theologians and even former atheists have all agreed on the validity of the resurrection. Nobody told me that. I was like, really? This is historic? Like, this is history? This is archaeology? They're like, well, yeah. Even in, when you read Acts 1 3, Luke, who's, a, who's like a historian, he's telling the story. He's getting eyewitness accounts. He says, listen, Jesus went around for like 40 days making himself known to people. Now, I don't know about you, but that would freak me out. It would also convince me. Paul tells to the Corinth church that not only did he go around for 40 days, but he made himself known to over 500 people. And Paul even says in his letter to Corinth that some of the people were still alive at the writing of that letter. Do you think those people would keep that a secret? Oh, no. Not me. I tell everybody. You telling me if I saw somebody raised from the dead, I'd keep that a secret? No, I'd be like, you wouldn't believe what I saw last night. I would tell everybody that. Everybody. Here's another one. How do people continually experience life-changing power in their life through Jesus if he's still dead? Anybody experience life-giving power through Jesus? Don't don't lie to me. Anybody anybody experience life? Okay, right. Dead things don't do things. True? I have an apple tree. If it makes it a winner, it will bear apples. If it doesn't, will it bear apples? No, because dead things don't do things. They don't do things. So why are people's lives still being changed by Jesus if he's dead? How do you explain the countless countless amount of known atheists, scientists, scholars, professors, people that are way smarter than all of us, converting to Christianity when they're trying to debunk it? I find that hilarious. Can I just encourage you? At some point, we've got to stop ignoring all the things written about Jesus in the ancient manuscripts. we got to stop ignoring it and just come to the conclusion that Jesus fulfilled all of it. At some point, we got to examine the math. This is what I had to do in my life. I had to just look at the math and just realize that there's an enormous improbability that the resurrection didn't happen. It's impossible that it didn't happen. And I had to just see clearly that not only did it happen, but it was seen and experienced by hundreds of people and that it's documented by eyewitnesses like it's real there comes a time in all of our lives and i had to get to this too that we either have to make a decision to accept the resurrection is true or close our eyes and pretend it didn't happen true there's too much history there's too much. And can we, just, can we just be honest? Some of us buy cars with less information. You ever bought an as-is car? Nobody wants to admit it. Most of mine are that. And you know, when you buy an as-is car and you ask questions about the car, guess what the dealer guy tells you? Well, it's as-is. You don't know if it's got brakes. You don't know if it's... Some of, us, some of us buy houses, sign major agreements, take jobs, move to places, make major medical decisions with our life with less investigation and less information than what you have in your hand right there, and yet we still won't believe. That's crazy. I'll tell you this. Be at ease, because I'm not here to force you to believe something you don't want to believe. That's not my job. I'm not here to go... Here's all the evidence you need to believe, and if you don't believe, you know, I'm not, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not here to do that. You just have to make the decision about what you're going to do with the information. Um, One of the things that I struggled with as as a young guy going into ministry is I thought that I had to have something clever and catchy to capture the attention of people so that they would believe the gospel. And then you read the Bible, and you're like, God's like, "Uh, that's not your job. And I'm like, sweet, that takes a lot of pressure off, right? But I'm on TikTok like the rest of you. 
and I see all these pastors with these cool, clever ideas, and I'm just like, wow, I need to climb two ladders and spread my legs and talk about choosing the, like, I need to do that, right? And I'm like, well, I'm scared of heights. I'm not doing that. You know, I got the gospel. I'm looking at the gospel, and I'm like, I'm like, God, I just need a, something clever, clever to capture the attention of people in the West because, you know, we just need it. And God's going, no. No, the Spirit of God draws the heart of man to the Father. So, dude, I'm telling you, I'm just, I'm just being for real. You got to do something with this. You got to reconcile this resurrection in your soul. Either it happened or it didn't. But I wish somebody would have told me the things I just told you. I probably would have came to God a lot sooner. Because when you start looking at it, it's like, yeah, it's a miracle. It's pretty amazing. For those in the room who ascribe the lordship of Jesus, in other words, for those in the room who are like, listen, I believe in the resurrection, I'm a Jesus follower, I got a question for you today. And this is it. Are we living like Jesus is alive? Are we living like Jesus is alive? Four counts of the gospel. The women come to the tomb way differently than the way they leave. You notice this? They come to the tomb way differently than the way they leave. They come to the tomb and, and, and they don't run to the tomb. They're not excited to go to the tomb. That makes a lot of sense, right? They're not excited. They walked with hesitation and sorrow. They didn't expect the tomb to be empty. Actually, they were too busy wondering and doing scenarios about who was going to move the rock. They didn't have a plan to see Jesus. No, their minds were too full and their hands too full of the incense and the preparation to continue the burial process of Jesus that had just started a few days before. But once they encountered the tomb, they returned different. They had a different attitude. They had a different message. And their souls were different. They'd encountered the risen Savior. And everything changed. They came to the tomb expecting to see a dead Jesus. But they left the tomb having encountered a risen Savior. The resurrection, my friend, is this. It is the pivot point of all Christianity. Because if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, I'm out. I'm out. I'll just be honest with you. If he, did, if he doesn't rise from the dead, I'm done. Because then he's no different than any other prophet, right? He's no different than anybody else. He's no different than my grandpa, right? If he doesn't rise from the dead, I'm out. But because Jesus is alive, and there's evidence, eyewitnesses, and you may say, well, there's not enough. How much more do you need? 2,000 years worth of stuff? And it, we know what kind of technology we have in the West, right? I've talked to people who are in law enforcement they, and SWAT teams and military, and they have these things that actually see through walls. And we can't find one guy's body? Are you serious? We put a guy on the moon. We can't find Jesus? We even have the places where he was born? where he was crucified, the time frame. Did you know there's three locations where they debate where Jesus was buried? Do you know what all of them have in common? They're empty. <laughs> Do you know what has never been up to debate for all those three places? The resurrection. The Jews will be like, well, I don't think, he was, I don't think that was the tomb. I think this was the tomb, right? And we go over there and we're like, still empty. Discovery Channel every year. We think we found Jesus. Every year it ends in a big disappointment because they haven't found him because he's alive. And because Jesus is alive, let me tell you something, because the resurrection is true, everything he said about himself is true. Everything he said about himself is true. Everything he said about forgiveness, mercy, grace, love, it's all true. Everything he said about God the Father, the Creator, it is all true. Everything he said about the kingdom of God is all true. And everything he promised, i.e. the very spirit of the living God indwelling in the people of God, it's true. It's true. It's true. Here's the question then. Why aren't we living or are we living that it, or are we living in a way that we believe that? Are we living in a way that, that, that we believe it is all true? And if we're not, why? Here's what happens sometimes. Believers, listen to me. If, if, if we believe Jesus is alive and we refuse to live like he's alive, we are neutering the power of the gospel. <laughs> we're watering it down. 
We're like, He is risen indeed. And then we don't live like it. We make it weak. We make it soft. And we turn Jesus into just a good person, did good things. They say the greatest evidence of the resurrection is found in the life and the faith of someone who follows him. And so here's my question. Why isn't every church in America, at least in the West, packed to the brim just like this every Sunday? Dude, this is an indictment on myself as well. I have to deal with this all the time. I know what you're thinking. I came here for an Easter gathering. I feel like I'm beat with a baseball bat. Dude, I'm just saying, like, can we just be honest about this? Can we just be real about this? You're like, I just came to feel good about my life. Jesus loves you. He's alive. Feel good about that. But then let's get on with it, right? Let's live for the king. Why isn't every church packed out like this? Could it be that followers have forgotten that he's alive? Because let's be honest, Easter comes every year, true? Have you noticed this? Pretty predictable. Comes every year. We know it's coming every year, right? On top of that, even if we didn't have the holiday to express our gratitude, we have the scriptures. Do you know that most houses in the West, and I don't know how they come up with a number 1.4, 1.5 Bibles in every house in the West. I don't know how you get a 0.5 Bible, but... In other words, most houses in the U.S. have almost like two Bibles. We have all the information, but yet, listen, for some reason, we kind of get numb to the whole resurrection thing. We just get numb to it. Like, next week, if I come in and go, he is risen, most of you would be like, dude, that was last week. <laughs> so many times I've thought about just, just, just advertising an Easter gathering every Sunday. <laughs> it's Easter, you know, July 6th, you know, it's like, because I know what would happen. People are like, it's not Easter. No, bro, it's Easter every single day. It's Easter every day. He doesn't go back in the tomb tomorrow. See, sometimes I think we forget. So that means right now, if he's alive, he is here in this place. Think about that for a moment. He's here in this place. Seriously, think about that. What would you do if Jesus showed up right here? I tell you what, before I knew Jesus, if a preacher had told me that, I would have left. I'd be like, it's getting weird, and if he shows up, I do not want to be in the same place. But listen, listen, he is here in this space. He is alive. He has no bounds. He cannot be, he cannot be strangled back. No, he has access. He is here. He's alive because living things do things. He's here. What if he showed up right now? How much less would you care about your meal that's on the crock pot at home? You're like, well, we're burning that today. <laughs> no, I'm serious, because I know how it feels just to sit there, right? Some of us, our mind is going 1,000 miles a minute. You got family that's coming to town. They're sitting here. You're looking at your watch going, I hope this guy doesn't go long. <laughs> I understand that. Our people in the lobby, they're like, man, this is great. We can leave, and he doesn't even see us. But what if he shows up right now? What if he shows up in your car? What if he shows up in your home? What if he shows up? What is your reaction? Can we just stop, stop for a minute and think about the things that we wouldn't care about anymore? How we look? How good the worship was? How much, how much less would you care about how cramped you are right now? I'll tell you what, if he was here, if he showed up, well, he is here. If he showed up in the flesh right now, dude, I'd be on my face. I'd be on my face. I'd look like a crying fool on my face. And all my family would know, I guess we're camping out here today. Dude, I wouldn't leave his presence. And here's the great thing about the gospel. It's because he's alive, those who put their faith in them have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of them. He is alive every single day in the lives of those who follow him. He's just as real. Just as real. And I think we forget that. We just think he's ethereal, mystical. No, he's not a fairy tale. He is real. He's more real than the person you're sitting next to. He's more real than the sound of my voice. He's more real than this building. He's more real than what you got home cooking. Dude, he is real. Living things do things. Dead things don't do things. I want to encourage you today. If Jesus is alive, and he is, dare to start living 
like you've come away from an empty tomb. Put yourself in the lives of these ladies who left. Do you think they were worried about what they looked like running? As a Jewish woman, you were not to run. Actually, as a Jewish man, it wasn't proper to run because of the way you would gird up yourself. It was kind of embarrassing. So when you ran, you ran for good reasons. Do you think these ladies were just like, oh, well, that was great. Let's go tell the brothers. Do you think they cared about dropping all the herbs, dropping all the things that, you know, I just kind of think when they left, all the things that just fell out of their hands that had to do with helping prepare a dead Jesus. Can you imagine being a bystander walking that path and going, man, what are all these jars just busted up on the road? Do you think they cared about what they looked like? Do think they cared about being proper? Do you think they cared about Jewish custom at that moment? I doubt it. If he's truly alive, and he is, let's dare to start believing God more. Let's dare to pray like he's alive. Man, so many times I think we come to God and, and we, we still pray like the tomb is still sealed. Start loving our neighbor, but do it differently. Do it like Jesus is alive. Start offering forgiveness, mercy, and grace to other people. Start sharing the good news of the gospel. See, here's the thing that I always think about. What makes a Muslim and a Hindu leave their religion and turn to Jesus? What makes them do that? You've got to think about this. Listen, you can change your faith all day long here in the West, and, and you're fine. You're protected. But if you're a Muslim or a Hindu in their country, if you deny that religion, let me tell you something, your whole life is on the line. Your family's life is on the line. Your business is on the line. What makes them want to do that? He's alive. That's what makes them want to do it. Because dead things don't do things. If Jesus is alive, then the world needs to know about it. I know what you're thinking. You're like, dude, this guy is out of his mind. And I will tell you something. If it was up to me, I would plant as many groups and as many churches everywhere and anywhere to make sure that everybody had an opportunity to hear the gospel. It is the most single important thing that any of us who follow Jesus could actually do with our lives. Now listen, don't come up to me and go, well, I think I'm called to be this. Yes, you are. But here's the thing. Just because you're called to do something with your life doesn't exempt you from sharing the gospel to everyone everywhere. It doesn't. The hard reality again is this. I can't make you believe any of this. I can't. I know that some of you are in the room and you're unconvinced and you're unwaveringly defiant like you're just like, dude, I don't care. I'm just here because I've been asked to come and there's food afterwards. I get it. I was in your shoes. That was me. I've told the story of the blue blazer when I was a kid. You know, Easter. That was when it, my mom gave us a blue blazer and I hated it. And I just suffered through some church thing because they were giving candy to kids. It was awesome. <laughs> but I didn't walk away there believing in God. I was just there to appease my mom, my dad. I know some of you just, you're just not, you're not, you're not going to believe any of this. And, and, and what I'm about to say may sound hurtful, but I wish somebody had actually had the guts to tell me this when I was, when I was, when I was telling people, like, listen, I don't believe any of this. You may sit there and you say, listen, man, I don't believe any of this you're saying. I think it's garbage. Can I just tell you something I wish somebody had the guts to tell me? You're wrong. I just wish somebody had guts to tell me that I was wrong. Nobody did that. They were just like, well, that's okay. I mean, you can believe what you want to believe. It's all right. It's good. And dude, they were sending me straight to hell, man. I went through so much hell in my life. And had I had Jesus, it would have helped me out. And I just had good friends that didn't want to offend me, didn't want to just take me to the side and say, wait, I get that you don't believe it. I get that you think it's a joke, but can I just be real with you? You're wrong. I would have had so many more questions like, okay, tell me how I'm wrong. Dude, that probably would have opened up the gateway to, to, to glory for me way earlier than what it did. So I don't say that to be a butthead to you. I'm just saying that to say this. I think you need to know that you're just on the wrong path, that you're in the wrong mindset with this. I get, that it's, I get that it's a lot to take in, but I would just tell you to trust in Jesus. And you may say, that's a lot to ask. Dude, you trusted that chair you're sitting in with no questions. You trusted in the car you rode in, no questions. You do tons of trust things that actually, if they fail, you would lose your life. I'm telling you to trust something that actually has historical evidence. I'm giving you stuff that you can actually research and read. Archaeologists actually use the scripture to find places to discover things. I'm asking you to trust something that is proven, not something that you're rolling the dice and taking a chance on. I wish somebody had told me that. 
We're sitting on over 2,000 years of history, archaeology, academia, and we still struggle. Please know this. You can sit with us and never believe, and you'll always be welcome. Because that's the way of Jesus. Listen, we, we care about your life with God. We want you to have a relationship with God. And we're willing to walk the distance with you. And a lot of that is because there's a lot of us here, somebody walked the distance with them. And a lot of us here wouldn't be here with our faith, with a Savior, if somebody didn't just say, hey, come sit with me, and, and it's cool if you don't believe this right now, but just come sit with me. Will you just come with me? And because they didn't feel like they were being looked at every day, like it just, you know, being hated on, they came and they sat, and eventually the Spirit did the work. So you can sit with us, but dude, I'm telling you, you're going to be sitting next to people who pray, so be careful. <laughs> they pray. If you got invited here and you don't know Jesus, I guarantee you the person sitting next to you that invited you, they've been praying for months. They're praying now. And you're going to see people like the rest of us who are following Jesus attempt to live a life like he is alive. And let me just spoil it for you. We kind of suck at it, but we're giving it our best. We're trying every day to live like Jesus is alive. We're trying to apprentice the ancient ways of Jesus. We're looking at the scriptures and going, man, I think I can, I think I can do this. I think I'm going to try this tomorrow. And everybody's encouraging me, like, dude, you should try that tomorrow. You should try praying for your boss. Dude, you should try. And we're not going to get it right all the time. So lower the bar, but we're trying. We're trying. I want to conclude, just give you four things. Because the resurrection is true. Number one, our sins are once and for all forgiven in Christ. Because he lives, our sins are forgiven. When we place our faith in him, we are given his spirit, and we're given forgiveness through his death, burial, and resurrection. It becomes an everlasting atonement, which feels so good. This gathering would look way different if Jesus never died and resurrected. <laughs> we don't have to sit under the weight of shame anymore, and our souls can experience freedom and relief from sin. The second thing is this, because the resurrection is true, we get to live a new life in faith in Christ. I don't know about you, but when I came to Christ, I needed to start living a new life. Because where, what I was doing, the way I was living, I'm just going to tell you, man, it was just dangerous. It was hellish. I mean, <laughs> I'm so thankful I got, to, I got to start living a new life because, man, I was, it was bad. We get an opportunity to make a choice to live our life for Jesus and an opportunity to experience joy and life in him. Number three, finishing up, we are able to sit in the presence of a holy God and not die. Read the Old Testament. You just don't pray to God. <laughs> You just don't like, like what we're doing? Like you just didn't do that. You couldn't just come to God. There was a giant veil that separated the presence of God from the people of God. And only the high priest could go in there. It was a sacred place. You couldn't do that. Well, I believe in Jesus. didn't matter. Matter of fact, if the high priest went in there and had a sin that was unconfessed, he would die in the presence of God. He would die. They actually would tie ropes around their ankles, lead it outside the curtain with bells on it, and as soon as things didn't start ringing, they'd give a little tug. Picture that for a moment. Imagine being on that fishing team. Imagine that. It's like, hey, Mike, John, Nick, you guys are holding the rope today. You imagine like, oh, man. And all of a sudden, you don't hear the bell, and you're like tugging, and he doesn't tug back. And you're like, tug again. He doesn't tug back, and next thing you know, right? <laughs> when Jesus died, something miraculous, a lot of things happened. One of the things that happened is that the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. It was an impossible feat. It only had to be done by the hand of God. It was super thick, and it was, but it was the veil that separated the Holy of Holies, the presence of God from the people of God. It's as if when Jesus died, the veil, when it was torn, the, came open, and you saw the mercy seat. It was as if God said, it's time to come in. And because the resurrection is true, now we can sit in the presence of God and enjoy him and still live.
because he's holy. And the last thing is this. You have a message to share. The women left the tomb and didn't keep things silent. They had a message to share. I find it interesting that even Jesus, when he was resurrected, didn't go incognito on everyone. He went around and for 500 people saw him for 40 days. That's like a month and a half-ish. That's crazy. That's crazy. He didn't hide out. He wasn't like, hey, I, wanna, you know, I, don't, wanna, I don't want people to see me. It's going to freak a lot of people out. I kind of wonder if he was like how he was with the ladies. He was like, greetings. <laughs> and they're like, he was like, don't be afraid. Can we just admit that that's, yeah, okay, I won't be afraid that, you know, Jesus of Nazareth is alive. He didn't make himself scarce. He rose and he showed himself to everyone. Everyone. Jesus is alive. And the more I think about that, the more I say it, I have tons of questions just with my own life. Why am I not taking more chances? Why am I not praying for more of my friends? I think about my own life. I'm like, wow, Wade, where have I been, you know, like, where have I been scared to truly step into the reality that the tomb is seriously empty? And if it's empty, Jesus is seriously alive. And if he's alive, he's seriously present in all of our lives as believers. I don't know about you, but man, I just get tired of riding the brake on my faith. And I got the same voice as you got in your head. You know, you don't want to be one of those crazy Christians. Wow. What does that even mean? Are people going to think you're weird? Can I just give you a heads up? If you believe in Jesus and people know it, and they don't believe in Jesus, they think you're weird already. They just do. We, we have those friends. We just do. I have those friends. They think I'm weird. That's fine. That's cool. They still want to hang out with me. That's a win. Can we just stop talking ourselves out of following Jesus and just surrender? Go all in. All gas, no break. Stand with me. I'm going to invite our worship team up. My hope today is that those who are here, if you don't know Jesus, and, and, you, and you've heard all this, and you're like, I don't know, maybe, all right, maybe, 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 maybe he is alive. Maybe this Easter thing is real. Maybe Jesus did die for my sin. Maybe, maybe the Bible is true. Maybe my prayer is that <laughs> the Spirit of God continues to stir that in you and doesn't give you an ounce of rest. <laughs> I wish somebody had prayed that over my life. I had tons of years where I was just like, I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's true. Maybe it's true. And eventually I had to come to the reality that you got to do something with that. You got to reconcile the, the resurrection. And if he's alive, then everything he said was true. Amen? We're going to take some time and we're going to take communion together. I know it's crowded. I can't do anything about that. Um, so good luck. Um, um, I understand that some of you guys are here and this is your, like your first experience with like quote unquote church um, and I'm glad you're here um, this would be my encouragement to you like if we're not it uh, let us help you find a community of believers to belong to you were never you were never built to do life alone you were never built to try to find God by yourself. We're to do this in community with one another. Um, we're here to help you. We're here to encourage you. Some of you are in this place and you've walked away from God. And you've walked away from God for a long time and you're here today and this is kind of your, this is kind of your tribute that you do every year. And I get that. I was the same way. Can I just encourage you today to really consider the reality that Jesus is alive and that you don't have to run from him. And can, can you do the hard work of just asking yourself, why am I running so hard from Jesus? Why, 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 am I, why am I running so hard from him? 
if you're like a friend of mine I had years ago, you probably have some misconceptions. My buddy, I won't tell you his name because many of you know him, it was years and years and years ago, he lost, uh, he lost his life. And, and here was the thing. He finally came to Jesus because somebody explained to him, this is crazy, that he didn't have to wear suits and sell Bibles. I looked at him. I said, are you serious? He goes, dude, that, I didn't want to do that. So I just didn't want to come. To, I didn't want to be a Christian. And I thought, holy cow. First of all, who told you that? I want to go lay hands on him quickly. But so many times we stay away from God for the wrong reasons. We think if I come to God, I got to be some religious nut. You know what? You can come to God and be yourself and just let God enter into your life. He created you. Listen, when I came to Jesus, I didn't stop doing a lot of things that I did. But the more I got close to Him, it was a lot harder to do the things I was doing. I had to make a choice. So today I invite you, come to Jesus. Surrender your life to Him fully. Make Him Lord. You're not going to get it right all the time, but let us help you with that. Join the family of God. Get on the mission of God. Find life and freedom and hope. We're going to take communion. Jesus took some bread and He took some wine. He took the bread and He, he blessed it and He broke it. And He told His disciples, His friends who were sitting with Him, He says, this is my body broken for you. He says, do this in remembrance of me, and none of them really understood that. But you know, when you have friends, they just kind of, okay. He passed it around, they all ate. He took the cup, and he gave thanks. He says, this is the cup of the new covenant, which is his blood. He said, take and drink. And they all took, and they all drank. Can you imagine what was going on in Jesus' soul, knowing that the bread represented his body, and when he broke it, how that must have felt, and what he must have thought when he passed the cup around that was red like the blood he would bleed out on a sinner's cross. He did that for you and me, my friend. I don't know about you. Actually, I do. None of us deserve it. Hell's the best we deserve. And Jesus comes to rescue and redeem us. I think that's pretty rad. So I invite you to come partake of communion. Remember not your sin, not your shame, but remember his goodness towards you and that he loves you and he cares for you and he just wants you to come home. Come home today. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the hard work that you did to pave a way back to yourself through your son, Jesus. And as we come to the table, we remember that the tomb is empty, that Jesus is king, and that he is alive. And if he's alive, then everything he said is true. Everything he promised is true. And we have so much evidence and so much stuff in front of us, God. I think we just need to get to that place where we just surrender. So God, we surrender today. In Jesus' name, amen. Worship team's going to sing. We don't pass this stuff around. There's four. There's a table there, two up here, one over there, and there's four in the back. Worship, come, take communion, and then we'll pray at the end and dismiss. I'm just going to ask you guys, um, we have a lot of people to take communion, but if you guys could just remain standing in place until this slide is over. We're going to sing through this a couple times and just let these words on this slide just uh, kind of permeate you. The hands that made me Nailed to a tree Even his last breath Given for me Sing that again. The hands that made me Nailed to a tree Even his last breath Given for me One more time The hands that made me Nailed to a tree 
even his last breath given for me death could not hold him nor could the grave Jesus has risen above every name and he Throw up my 
good news of the gospel is that the tomb is empty and the thing that tried to hold Jesus captive in a dead man's spot has been rolled away and set on. (laughs) And those who guarded him at the cross, they guarded him at the tomb and both of them failed. It made Jesus king, king of glory, king of heaven and earth, king of kings, the great I am. He is, he is alive. Whether we want to believe that or not, I will tell you this, the sun does